Hi, Cameron. How are you doing? I'm great. Great to see you, Giorgio. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so, frankly, I'm jazzed about this. Very exciting. And it's, it's so good to see you again. You were such a great <laughs> guest when you joined us in our podcast. We had so much fun. That That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank, thank you so much. I'm really honored. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm sorry. I, 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 I need to calm down. I need to calm down. Yeah, how can we not be, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> interesting stuff we're going to talk about. It's such a great time to be alive. There's so many great things going on. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, well, can you can you help us introducing yourself a bit? Uh, sure. You know, personal or professional or combo of both? Oh, let's start. I don't know. You decide. You decide. You, you, you pick one. I mean, our, our connection is through our, our my day job. So I'm... And I'm not a big fan of titles, but I'm formerly the executive chairman of a company called PWL Capital, which is a, a private investment management and financial planning firm in Canada. I'm based in Ottawa. We have team members across the country. So we're an independent, privately owned, employee owned company that provides complete wealth management services to our clients. We have about 1,250 families that we help with sure. their wealth management. 250 okay 1250 1250 yeah. okay 1250 wow. so we're considered like a we're still small compared to the banks but we're considered a large independent you know we're large enough to 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 be able to build out a full complement of team members but we're small enough that we still know all of our clients and we can do very personalized service and through the through the pandemic we're able to largely through the podcast actually attract a lot of great talent to join our team so we've largely gone virtual. I'm in our office in Ottawa, but most of our team members work virtually in oh, from, all know, from British Canada. Columbia. All from Canada. Yeah, we all work in Canada for Canadians. We're registered in Canada. So we're formerly an investment brokerage company. So I started my practice back in 1991, <laughs> if you can believe it. So it's 30 plus years. Wow. And the team is, I mean, we were small for the first 20 years or so and then in the past decade we really had some lucky events happen in our world and we were able to grow quite dramatically especially over the last five years so now we have 75 people on our team which is 75 people okay yeah, I think it's wow so you're growing a lot experience. so uh, yeah. let's say that I, I will start telling you that i'm on a personal fight like let's call it fight against the italian financial advisory industry so i <laughs> i hope we are gonna show people uh, how things can be done differently before doing that I, I want to just say that this podcast is not sponsored by anybody not even by pwl capital uh, so it's not like a a paid sponsorship it's like just me wanted to talk with cameron and uh, yeah so you you joined uh, PWL Capital back in 1997? Six, seven, yes. Seven, but you started in 1991 with this, uh, in this industry. So before Correct. PWL Capital, what did you do actually? So I grew up, I was a butcher as a kid in small town Quebec. And I ended up getting accepted to go to McGill University, which for me and, and, and our family was a pretty big deal. And I ended up graduating from McGill in commerce and in commerce, I was in commerce. So I have an undergrad in, in marketing and entrepreneurship. And I ended up being approached, you know, at the university, like companies come through and one of the big beef packing companies in Canada came in and said, oh my gosh, we've got a business grad who was also a butcher. So I was offered a job on the spot <laughs> and I was so thrilled to get a job in a company car. I took it. So I sold beef for a couple of years. Wow. <laughs> but uh, but quickly realized that selling commodities was hard to add value to like mm. beef. It's it's a pure commodity. But and I've got my cow up my wall here, as you can see. <laughs> I, uh, a lot of similarities to being in a butcher shop, believe it or not, to what we do. Then you move to the re where the real meat is. It's, it's 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 different meat, right? But it's it's not and it's not a commodity, which is what's the beautiful part about it. We're able to add value to something. Sure. Sure. And have a relationship. Believe it or not, when you're in a small town butcher shop, you actually have a relationship with your customers, right? You know what's going on in the world. You know if they're having a special company, they have a special cut they want. So I, I jokingly say like I'm kind of in a modern day butcher shop doing financial planning for people. 
It's a very tailored service. Thanks very for tailored, very relationship oriented. You really get to know the people. And, and, and the team environment here that we work in is much like the environment in this small town butcher shop, right? I'm not a big fan of titles. It's like we all work together to try to do the best thing collectively as we possibly can for the end, the end customer. <laughs> and what, did, what, what brought you to the financial advisory industry? I was tired of selling a commodity and this in, in the early 90s, mutual funds were just becoming popular. Uh, Canada created, I think, the the deferred, what's, what's called the deferred sales charge, which is you get paid a load, a commission to sell a mutual fund. And I quickly huh. learned the math that if you sell $10,000 of a mutual fund, you make $500. So it was, and, and I, I'm, I'm not proud of my roots. I'm proud I came through it and what I've accomplished, but I largely joined to sell something else. Instead of selling a cow, you're selling a mutual fund. But so essentially, no formal training. Canada in 1996 was like Italy's today, because today there's still like people who join the financial advisory industry because hey, you can sell a mutual fund or an active fund and ask three, four, five percent upfront fees uh, plus like yeah. regarding fees. So yeah, uh, but luckily for us and for your customers, uh, then you you PW Capital like has a completely different business model right now. Well, so I started in the commission business and realized like, okay, if I sold a $100,000 investment, I'm making $5,000. If you sold a $500,000 investment, you make $25,000. It's like, this didn't make sense. <laughs> so I quickly decided that I want to get into what was just being born, the fee service, you know, mm -hmm. fee for service, paid a management fee. So we, I then, along with my partners at the time, discovered the founders of PWL Capital in the mid '90s and said, "Oh, we can go to this fee-based environment where you, you, you avoid all the commissions, right? And commissions came from selling active mutual funds, which I know you know all about. Yeah. And so we we came into this fee-based world, stopped charging commissions, stopped getting the trailer fees, and you got paid by the client. So you, you disentangled." the payment of advice from the delivery of the product. So and that was we, already in the mid nineties. That Canada. was 96. And we were told at the time, you better do it fast because fee base is coming. Well, that didn't happen for a long time. So we were way ahead of the curve, but the next interesting thing that happened and Canada was the first dude to, to come up with uh, an ETF. Wait, ETF what? actually started in Canada. I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was created in the U.S., but Canada okay. was the first to implement on the market an ETF. So the ETF revolution, the indexing revolution started in Canada. And it's incredible. Once you take away your compensation and you're paid by the client, all of a sudden, all the reasons why indexing makes sense, they open up to you because index funds didn't pay a commission. ETFs don't pay a commission. So well, if you're paid by the client... One. Uh, you mean well, in our world, they don't. There's no compensation for oh, us okay. to do e sure. ETFs. But we used to be trained in the old active world why indexing didn't make sense. And of course, they're all nonsense, but we used to accept this. Wait, wait, wait. This is actually new to me. So you were trained to to believe in the fact that, that index fund. I actually, you know, I, I, read a I recently read a study that was based on Canadian uh, financial advisors. And they discovered that actually... Like a large percentage of Canadians' financial advisor, up until 2012, probably, they actually owned in their own portfolio the same crappy active funds that they were selling to customers. So they actually they weren't like evil in putting this thing no, into no. their portfolio. They actually believed that. Yes, the intentions are good. Just the knowledge was, <laughs> was low. And uh, there's, I, I think, the vast majority of advisors still believe in active management and they okay. believe that's a big part of their value proposition. Uh, we just don't share that view. And but, but once you disentangle the compensation, it's like everything opens up. This can, this makes so much sense, right? You can look at the evidence objectively because you're not paid to sell something else. And that happened at, the, at that exact time, like the late nineties, ETS became popular, indexing became popular. And it was quite a, quite incredible, uh, incredible time. And, and 
we know what's happened to to the ETF marketplace since then. It's absolutely exploded. In indexing has exploded, awareness has exploded, and that's why I say it's such a great time for for consumers in this marketplace if they're aware of the, the these great ideas and products and tools to do this. So let me recap so far. So in Canada, in mid nineties, ETFs uh, like were born. Like in Europe, uh, things happen like at the end of the uh, first decades of this millennial. So actually in 2009, the first at 2008-9 and fina financial you, you were trained back then to believe in the fact that uh, active funds were better. What what were do you remember which which was the like main argument pro active management? It's like well, you can Why beat the you? market the index are risky because if if the market falls 50%, you lose 50%. Like what well, we are active managers. Exactly. Now, when I say trained, I, I don't mean trained by the industry. I mean or the, the the regulatory bodies. I mean trained by the industry or sure, sales companies. Sure, sure. But it was like, Giorgio, you don't want to be average. <laughs> sure. We, why? Like nobody wants to be average, of course. So we can choose the stocks and can beat the market, which is, of course, intuitive. Yeah, sure. Everybody you, beats the market. Yeah. Well, and and and, and you know that's mathematically impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the, the Sharps arithmetic of active management. Um, but those were the very common arguments, right? But it all came down to compensation. Sure, the next funds sure. did not pay a, a, a compensation or, or a commission. So let's see how how PWL Capital like uh, expanded, uh, survived. It's like a, it's not a, the perfect word. Like you actually thrived. You are thriving in this, in this with this business model. So well, you joined PWR Capital back in 1997, if I remember correctly. And uh, how, how was it back then? Well, the company was very small when we joined it. Just we, I consider myself a near founder. I joined about a year after. I thought you were the founder, but actually I then discovered no, you were not. You joined the, the year, uh, one year later. A year after. So it was very small. But the, the, the three founders were, were visionaries, right? They wanted to integrate the planning which is what really mattered. They were planners at heart, but they wanted to integrate the planning with the implementation of portfolios. Mm -hmm. And that's where our hearts were as well. We were passionate about the planning and the people. And that's, that's where the meeting of the minds was. It wasn't so much about indexing. Because indexing was just really starting. The awareness was just starting. But we were not all on that page in mm -hmm. the beginning. And I mean, those are still the roots of the business. I, I think most people come to us and... A big part of the of what people value is the planning and that relationship to help people think through their financial decision making. Now, I think a lot of people do come to us because of the, you know, markets work philosophy, call it indexing, call it efficient market hypothesis for that framework of thinking. A lot of people come for that, but you can get that cheaper you can avoid our fees by going direct to a robo or an etf on your own or that, 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 that's a nice point yeah so why people do choose to still come to you instead of doing things on their own i mean i, I of course know the answer there are many many <laughs> i think everybody knows the answer right <laughs> everyone has different values everyone values their time differently some people don't want to do it some people think they'll end up better off. Some people are just, they're not competent with, with making these kinds of decisions. It's a tough, it's a money. Life is messy. Let's go back to the basics. Life is messy. Stuff happens. People get sick. They die. They get divorced. All kinds of things happen, right? Number one, no, number two, our, our, our markets happen. We get extreme events. Extreme events are always connected to, to stories about how bad things are going to be. This can cause you to really misbehave and not capture the returns that are there for the taking in the markets. Very few people earn the returns of the markets. And that comes largely due to behavior. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and, and money flows through everything. So much of our lives like are money decisions because really what you're doing is when, when you're saving, if you have a lifetime of income, right? Saving is really reducing your consumption today for consumption in the future. So you're pushing money ahead to the future, right? And humans are, the, are, are I think, the only species on earth that can actually travel through time. So we can imagine ourselves in the future. We remember our lives in the past. We, we're always time traveling, right? 
And it's how you make decisions as you time travel in this world of consumerism and how do you make decisions of how you spend but save to make sure you're fine for the future. And in a messy life, that's not an easy thing to do, let alone understand all the tax rules, all the planning rules, all the investment products. And we are absolutely buried these days in information about investing. I would say more so than ever in all kinds of different platforms. So there's no shortage of information. And I would argue that's leaving us as a society more financially illiterate because there's so many more options, so many more compelling people being spoon fed to us. Hmm. Right. That shows up on our phone and our feed with and it is it's littered with all kinds of financial advice by very compelling people. Hmm. The, the, this is like a topic <laughs> that would probably like take take 10 hours to explore because you, you you also know that there are many kinds of people that try to give you financial advice that there are like an entire spectrum from, I find myself when I want to learn something new, I go to internet and then I find uh, too many, too, too, too many sources. And sometimes I just want to get somebody who's uh, more in the field to say, Hey, where should I start from? But actually probably the mistake we all made with that we are not in the financial industry is that uh, financial uh, advisors are just there for uh, helping me with the asset allocation, which is probably just a minor part of what do you actually do. Absolutely. Very there small is, part. There is a question from the audience, which I think it's very pertinent. It's very like timely. And uh, it's from De Peru that says, uh, did, did you have any problem convincing customers, clients, uh, that, that most of industry do things differently? Like, uh, hey, but uh, the, the other advisor told me that they can beat the market. Why you don't promise that? Yeah, we've long given up trying to change people's minds. It's very, very hard to change people's minds. And a lot of people confuse you know, the decision process with the outcome because, of course, in a market this big, there's always going to be great performing active managers without a doubt. They're always held up. Well, you didn't beat them. Well, of course, just random chance. Yeah. You're going to have people that outperform. So again, that makes things very, very noisy. But if you actually systematically stand back and look at the evidence, and, and, and as you know, we've interviewed dozens, if not probably over 100 academics in this space, and you, you know the amount of time that Ben and I put into this. But if, if you boil it all down to real simple concepts, the basic belief is markets work. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not saying prices are right. But when you have this much competition by this many smart people around the world with endless budgets for technology and research, you got to think that collectively they're pretty smart, right? Well, they're setting the prices every day, right? They set the prices. And, and as a someone who accepts that markets work, call it indexing, call it Efficient market, call it whatever you want, some sort of efficient market framework. You're basically accepting those prices with assuming those prices are trading with a reasonable expected, expected is the key, expected return going forward. Because everyone that's making those trades, and think of all those trades every day there's a buyer and a seller, and they're probably pretty smart. And with the rise of indexing, I would argue the smarter ones are surviving. So arguably, the people that are left as active managers Mm. are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. To their credit, they're brilliant. They're doing great work. Many of them will outperform. A lot of those ones that do outperform, like the so-called great managers, are hard to get access to for a Mm -hmm. bunch of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Jim Simons is not open for you. That's the... They're not waiting. You and I would invest in, in rent tech all day long. <laughs> you can't get in. Sure, sure. Right? Cliff Asnes told us that. Cliff of AQR told us that when he was on the podcast. I would put money there all day long also. You can't get in. But the point being is that those are the people that are trading and picking up that arbitrage, that their, their returns, right? But all those trades are happening with an expected return on them. So as someone who believes that markets work, or at least work well enough to meet the goals that us as individual investors and our clients, going back to the plan, what kind of return do you need? How much risk do you want to take on? 
how much risk can you live with? So, so t- too often people just want to beat the market. So, okay, that's great. But what, <laughs> what return markets? do you need? <laughs> are, are you saving enough money? For mm-hmm. many people, if you just save a bit more, I mean, this is a great quote I, I read in, uh, we're interviewing uh, Nicholas Berube in a couple of weeks for the podcast. He had a quote from Jerry Seinfeld. And the quote was, people keep telling me my money should work harder. And he says, nah, I want to do the hard work. I prefer my money to relax. <laughs> <laughs> suggesting to me that he wants a more conservative portfolio of bonds or term deposits or something. I'm, I'm only inferring that from, from sure, the comment. Sure, sure. But again, that's that's that person's preference, right? So people are different, right? People react differently when markets go up and down. That's why it's a very personal decision, but it's got to be anchored in the plan. Otherwise, like you're just investing to beat the market. Mm-hmm. What, what what's your benchmark is exactly like like this yeah what do, what do you I, mean i've been reading like in public uh, recently a couple of articles from meb faber i don't know if you know if you know him sure no man and he has uh, like a few i think they are great articles they they should be uh, i mean i i don't care much about the advices inside but i care about the philosophy so the the portfolio to get rich is different from the one of, for staying rich and people care at different things based on where they are on their life path, on their financial path. So somebody w- which acquired like a generational wealth uh, that can survive three generations, they are more preoccupied of not losing money instead of like beating the market. So it's really different. Probably, I think maybe you, I think you, you as a PWS Capital, you handle like wealthy customers probably not people with like ten thousand dollars i assume so they might have different objectives of course yes yeah, so our median client is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars our average client is well over million. a million dollars well we over some a million. very okay we have some very large clients yeah yeah great but again if, if you believe markets work just that principle markets work and that battle is going on every day between buyers and sellers. <laughs> and think of it at the company level, the battle going on a company is competing for business, competing for capital, yeah. competing to raise money. Like there's so much competition. You got to think at some level that this is working. And the markets have largely delivered good returns over long periods of time. And at most people don't get what the market has to offer. It's the so-called behavior gap that mm. Carl Richards talks about. I've seen, uh, I've heard Ben talking a lot about this in his po- in his like channel or uh, also in the Money Scope podcast uh, and sometimes yes. international reminder of the gap between investment return and investor return. I, I assume, I hope you will devote a podcast episode to this like issue, to this topic. I, I would love to, to know more because it's also the, uh, sometimes people say, oh, if you invested a uh, hundred euros in NVIDIA five years ago, yeah, but what are the odds that I would get like 80 per, 80, 80 times my return? I would probably just have sold that two, two X, five X, or it's really, and the gap gets wider, the more volatile is the underlying in the asset class or the asset. Yeah. That's why I recently heard Ben saying that, uh, yes, uh, dividend are irrational, but the gap is is thinner uh, between investor return, investor return for people who follow like a dividend strategy. So that, that's that's a nice topic. I would love to to hear more uh, data from from the Rational Reminder uh, podcast and community. Anyway, well, the, can the it, dividend can one is so interesting because dividends do drive better behavior. People yeah. love dividends. Yeah, so, w- which means in the end, if you if if the if the best strategy is the one that you can stick with, and that. That, okay, yeah, the, 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 that's a nice, interesting exploration. It's a classic uh, Morgan Housel. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't even ordered the new book. I should, I should. Oh, it's, fan, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> I, I have him watched later. I still need to listen to your uh, episode with Morgan Housel. Anyway, so what actually, what are you, what's your role in PWR Capital these days? You, you, you are executive chairman 
then portfolio manager, CIM, FMA, FCSI. Can you tell us about what are those, those symbols, those acronyms? So, so, so those are designations in the securities business in Canada. I would, I would, in general, I'd say they're kind of old fashioned now. Well, CIM is not. CIM is a designation in Canada. You need one of them. You need to do discretionary portfolio management. So I've had that for decades. Uh, the FMA is the Securities Industries um, Financial Planning designation. It's 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 still recognized, but they're no longer being given out. CFP, the Certified Financial Planner, has become the standard. Okay, so I know our, the all of our advisors have the CFP. And the FCSI is a your fellow of the Canadian Securities Institute. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's basically you do enough courses and you apply, they, they <laughs> let you into this fellowship. But uh, it's, it's not like having a CFA or CFP. Okay. So, okay. so those are the more modern, very high quality designations that many of our team, like we have many CFAs, all of our advisors have CFPs. So we have an incredibly talented bench. So most of my time is spent on, I'm largely out of the day-to-day -day operational side of the business. Okay. It's more strategy, board, thinking about the direction of the company, thinking about you know specific strategic initiatives, networking. I spend a lot of time networking with peers of myself in the industry. We have a great community. Uh, so I spend yeah, a lot other, of time. Other advisors, other... Uh... Uh, other advisory firms oh, that's I spent fair. a lot of time you know traveling i was in new york a couple of weeks ago to meet someone that's has a role like mine in the u.s we try to exchange best practices and you know, spend things time thinking about how do you grow do you grow organically so building out our social media platform do you do it inorganically by trying to attract other advisors to join you well if you do that how do you attract it how do you structure it is it a what, what kind of deal could it be, right? So th those things take a lot of time. And then, of course, the podcast is an enormous amount of time. Yeah, Probably we will, uh, we will, uh, we'll explore the podcast. That. Uh, in a, in so a that's, that's where I spend my time. And, and a lot of time just talking to the team. I just love working with, with you know, various people on the team on different initiatives. Did you, did you meet uh, in New York the Barry Riddles uh, or Josh Brown or... Uh, this trip, uh, no, but I know, I know, I know that group, and I know Barry and and Nick Majuli pretty I, well. I, I love them. I also like like uh, you and the uh, Riddles Wealth Management. Uh, they are like you. You are like my main podcast and main main source of information from the yeah from the North America. I would say so. They are, um, they're communication experts. Those guys. They are just killing it. Yeah, I'm a big fan. So they're good. <laughs> Actually, good you told people. me that the that the rational reminder was born after you uh, were avid consumers of the Animal Spirit podcast, and then you decided to do your own version. Wow, Ben and I said, "Yeah, that's that's good." That's, there. that's two guys talking. <laughs> we're two guys. We can talk. We had no idea what we we're doing. We just started recording, and there you go. That's how it started. Almost six years ago. Six years ago. Okay. So we are talking about the rational reminder podcast. Let, let, let's go there. Then we will move back to the sure. to the financial advisor industry because I have many many more questions to ask. But I, since we are talking about the rational reminder podcast, I would start with a question from the audience, which is from Maurizio Barenzan, which is also a dear friend of mine. Question: Are you planning to invite Bill Perkins, Die with Zero, to the podcast? I saw you invited Daenerys. Very very interesting. Both talk about the life decisions. Uh, yeah, I believe he's on the list for potential guests. We're booked up for most of this year. In fact, we we wow. If you're a regular listener, wow. you know we've we've had a real uh, glut of incredible guests uh, so far this year. So we've actually missed some of Ben's you know every other week deep dives. So I'd love to. I must admit that they also love the deep dives. So oh. I, I, I wish to. I wish you will do more. <laughs> ben, I, I, well. We, Yes, we just had so many great guests come up that uh, Ben Ben said, "Okay, let's 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 get these guests through." Like they've been incredible, and we have more guests coming up. We're booked, I think, right through the fall. Hmm. Through the fall, so so I was actually lucky that we, I, I got a spot like a month after we scheduled it. So you are way more busier now with the podcast. Um, 
yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty busy, but it's pretty incredible, right? Like quality of these guests, like Mayor Statman's got a book coming out. Scott Galloway, if people listen to Prof G, he, we we got Prof G coming up. Okay, Dan oh, Harris wow. was a phenomenal guest. Abby Sussman's coming on. Um, Adam Alter's coming on. The Anatomy of a Breakthrough author, phenomenal. We had Todd Rogers came out today. Okay, you know, writing for yeah. writing for busy uh, readers, which was just and to take a science approach to that. So we have these incredible, and I'm I'm missing some. Uh, I apologize, but there's just been so many great people. You want to you want to get in front of our audience. So we've been doing that. But I agree, we need more of Ben's deep dives. They're so good. But probably I imagine Ben Ben is also like split because it's, I think it's getting more responsibility in PWL, so more other podcasts. So yeah, it's probably hard to do everything. I know. I know how it works. His other podcast is no joke. The money scope. I mean, it, I, I think him and, and the doctor are doing such a great job. I mean, it's truly as a financial literacy course mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. largely evergreen and it's not, many episodes are not Canadian centric at all. Hmm. Yeah. I must admit that I, I'm a bit behind on that. Uh, about the rational reminder, do you, do you do everything alone or, uh, or do you get some help? Well, we get help on the production, of course. Mm-hmm. We use the same producers as Animal Spirits does, and ah, okay. And Patrick O'Shaughnessy, we share the same production team as them because that's all oh, wow. post broad. But all the up to the point of being recorded, it's all Ben and myself. Okay, so you you decide which are the guests. Uh, you contact them. You invite them. You you decide how the qu- question list like. We, we find the guest, we, um, well, Barry Ritholtz is a good example. So I, I, I knew mm. Scott Galloway has his new book coming out and I listened to Scott Galloway's podcast and he mentioned that he's friends with Barry Ritholtz. So I reached out to Barry and said, can you help me get in front of, I, I'd already tried to reach Scott, but Barry made an introduction to the producer. So there's an example of, you got to be aware of the, the horizon and what's going on to try to make those connections. Same thing with Dan Harris, as you you know, Hal Hirschfield, Professor Hal Hirschfield is a very good friend of ours. He's been on three times now. He was on Dan Harris's podcast, and I listened mm. to it because I'm, I'm a I listen to Dan regularly. So I reached out to Hal and said, "Can you make an introduction?" So it's these connections that 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 you have to cultivate to get a chance to pitch to get these guests on, and sometimes they say yes. Often they say no. It's a, it's, okay. a, it's a game of numbers, right? Is so, there some no that that that, that you are I don't know, sorry about? Say, oh, I really wanted uh, to, but maybe, you, maybe it's not even nice to say. Well, no. um, or if there is some. Well, what, one that was recent that that hopefully we get on one day. I'd love to to welcome on Richard Thaler. I'm a huge fan of his work. Okay. We we had his 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 co-author of many books, um, Professor Cass Sunstein. He said yes. So okay, okay. And I, and I don't blame I don't blame sure, Professor sure, Taylor. Sure. I'm sure he has lots of requests. He's a phenomenal person. I've listened to many of his podcasts. So I I don't mean any ill will at all. <laughs> but it just shows you like that didn't work out. But Cass Sunstein did, and Cass was fantastic. I mean, the the, the man's a legend, right? <laughs> so. It's just the way it goes. It's, but it's part of the fun, right? It's so much fun. Like Dan Harris was so much fun to try to get on. And it's a perfect example of something that's not financial. But as you, if you listen to it, you realize we're all trying to help people's well-being here. And yes. that's what his message is. It's about well-being. And, and, and if you listen to the interview, he talked about how having a financial advisor is really wonderful to have someone that you can worry with, mm-hmm. worry about your mm-hmm. finances with. So we, we try to tie it into financial decision making and and some listeners, yeah, they prefer, I think, more frequent deep dives from Ben. You know, we, we call it kind of nerding out and stuff, which we love too as well. We're trying to broaden it because these are things, especially for me, that are 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 really interesting to me. But Ben as well, right? Ben Ben appreciates the 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 lesser technical, non-academic, but still great value add kind of information. I remember at one point you you had like a, a few episodes where you a bit uh, moved into the field of like uh, happiness and life satisfaction at one point. So it's a topic oh, that yeah. you sometimes come back to because it's all connected. No, 
you want to What's... better handle your <clears throat> better handle your finances in order to have a better life. Well, look at the conversation we had with we had, you on yeah, designing sure. your life. It was wonderful. <laughs> you 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 blew me out of the water. Like you elevated that book so beautifully. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I'm still I still don't know how did I end up on the podcast, but I I I, I imagine myself like the, the the episode right after with the authors of the book and then me like getting very small. So apart from me, which which I I, I and and. And people like Eugene Fama, Robert Merton, oh. Barton Malkiel. <laughs> uh, do you do you have like your f- personal favorite episodes, the one where you where you learn the most? Oh, I've learned the most. So, um, I mean, th- those three are legends, of course, right? We've had legends on, which has been incredible. Like to spend. I think almost two hours with Professor hmm. Fama, 61 hmm. questions. And he was a, a delight, a total <laughs> delight. And I, I've had the good fortune to meet him. He would know me. I'm not overstating this, but I've met him and heard him speak many times. And I have immense respect. You think about it. He's been studying capital markets since before I was born. And I'm almost 58. <laughs> and he works every day of the year. So, of course, the legends are, are awesome. Just it's so impressive and so articulate. But some of the things that, that 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 had a big impact, like I think of, I think it was Ralph Keeney mm-hmm. on goal on goal setting, and that really like like Ben was so taken by that he went and built this goal setting exercise. You know the whole notion of if I ask you once, Giorgio, give me your goals, okay, park them. Hmm. Now go and improve on them on your own, okay. You'll improve them. You'll get a better list of goals, okay. Now if I show you a list of 20, 50, 100 goals, you'll go through that list and say, oh, now you've improved it again. Well, he taught us all about that. That had a huge impact. Um, mm. We had you ever um, end up doing like this exercise for yourself? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's fascinating. So we did a big goals exercise. Ben did it, again, to his credit with, I forget the numbers, but it was a material number of people submitted their goals. And he spent a lot of time boiling them down to get down to I think it was 50 or so okay. uh, financial goals to help people make better financial decisions. Because if I just ask you randomly, what are your goals? Like, ah, uh, yeah, 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 it's higher, <laughs> educate my kids, give to charity, but it's not as well thought through and you haven't thought of all the options. So that was one. Hmm. Um, Chris Hadfield, the, the famous Canadian oh, astronaut. Oh, right, right. Wait, wait, wait. Chris Hadfield. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I I was like just staring for randomly to the to his book. Oh wow, yeah, oh. yeah. I remember I, him. I I loved him. Like even before he was on your podcast, I, I used to to watch all his videos on YouTube about life on the on the ISS. That was like incredible, incredible. But I mean, it, it, and that was not a very popular episode up front because people saw astronaut not interested. So it was one of well, our lowest well, initial downloads. Okay. And it picked up after we 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 kind of oh. talked it up a little bit. The book is amazing. Take away, it's like a the little. big takeaway there is you know, we, we talked about what's it like being an astronaut? Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, the joy is in becoming an astronaut. You have to enjoy that journey. <laughs> so you have to enjoy becoming. It's not being. It's not arriving that you're an astronaut. No, no. It's about all those years of absolute ruthless dedication he did. But you have to enjoy that. I remember he usually say that he would stop this career once he had like three consecutive days that he didn't want to go to work, but it never happened. I remember this probably yeah. coming out of his mouth. <laughs> but there's been so many incredible guests, like Anna Maria Lusardi on financial literacy. Um, I should, I should Ludovic Fallopu on private equity was phenomenal like, to get access to these people. Um, I let fish back on goal setting. Uh, it, it, mm. it goes on and on, right? There's just been so many. I'm, I'm going to leave people out. <laughs> it seems you are more this. interested to non-financial uh, guests, which which makes uh, sense, maybe in your that's like a, point in time in your life, probably. Yes, yes. Ben maybe. said that to me because we we interviewed um, yesterday, and this was a totally personally self indulgent interview. We interviewed Randall Stutman, who is a founder of the Admired Leadership Institute. Okay. 
I don't know if you've heard of Randall or not. I am a r- raving it's fan a of, name of, of him and who he represents. Name. He he was on Shane Paris's podcast. Sure, and oh, and the the book about the um, uh, the he wrote a book. Uh, uh, it's the same person. The book about uh, how's it called? The um, I don't remember the the movement. I the, uh, the movement of. Uh, I could look it up. <laughs> yeah, know. sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I remember the name because it's about the effective altruism, something like this. No, no, okay, no, okay. I, I, it's wrong. No, he's he founded the Admired Leadership Institute. Like, I'm Ah, okay, okay. I find how to build an organization, to build Mm -hmm. a team, to deliver something special. That is very fascinating to me. So, uh, I we got Randall Stubman to come on, and, and Ben said at the end of that, he said. You love this stuff. This less financial. <laughs> so I, I have been moving to that direction. So we might be kind of shifting the podcast streams hmm. a little bit. I, I still do love the financial side, um, but I, I honestly Ben is so good that I, I feel like I don't add as much value. Although I think there is value in having a lay person. Mm-hmm. Less technical a person try to explain some of these concepts, but Ben Ben is he's the real deal. He is he's the gold standard, in my opinion, in communicating these ideas. I think you are great at letting people believe that they are great. Uh, the, the, what I'm getting to know you a bit better is that you you are amazing at like uh, like a, at helping people. understanding how good they are so you're probably if if i have a superpower and i've i've never stated this before but i have no desire to be the smartest person in the room Mm. none like i love delegating i love empowering people i love i just love it like and i have a very young i I should learn from you (laughs) our team is very young our average age of our team is mid 30s you know i'm mid 50s and it used to be in our industry a common belief that well you can't have people more than ten years younger than you seeing clients. Mm. Some of our best advisors, all of our advisors are phenomenal. We have phenomenal advisors that are more than thirty years younger than me, and they're okay. handling some of our largest clients. Okay, wow. so I don't buy this age thing at all. If you get the right people, the right motivation, and the right opportunity to experiment, to try things, to learn, to develop, and and mm. and I mean. Ben's a perfect example. Like he, who he is now is not who he was when he arrived here. I want to know more. I want to know more about this. So how, how did Ben get like, like, did you hire him? Yes. Okay. Like perfect decision. (laughs) Um, It wasn't obvious at the time. None Hmm. of us are who we were 10 and 20 years ago is not who we are today. And this is something he said yesterday. He said, I love looking back. I think he said, I love looking back and being embarrassed at who I was because it means you improved and learned a lot. It's like, wow, that's really profound. Yeah, I, I find, like, I, I, I have this feeling, like, every other year. So I think either I'm improving, like, at an exponential rate uh, or I'm still dumb and and there's no way out of it. <laughs> and we just, we we met a couple times while he was doing his MBA here in Ottawa. And during his MBA, he was being mentored by a competitor of ours. So he joined them upon graduating out of loyalty. And we stayed in touch. And then he uh, participated in an article, like Ask Your Advisor or something like this, in, in, in Canada's national newspaper, the Globe and Mail. And he didn't know very much, so he responded in this article that he would recommend this active mutual fund from Fidelity. He got absolutely blasted in the <laughs> comments in the article. Like you would not believe it. So he's like, whoa. Right? Uh-huh. And he did not, that's not what you want to hear. And he was brand new in the industry, right? Okay. <laughs> and so it caused him to go back to say, well, what, how should we be investing? And then through that, through his exploration, he ended up getting introduced to me and we were looking to hire because I put the word out through my networking that we wanted to hire. So we just happened to to meet again 
and I convinced him, I guess, mutually convince each other to let's come together. Now we were much, much, much smaller than we are today. He would have been on our team employee. I don't know. Oh, not even 10. Okay. Oh, wow. Five, okay. Five, six, something like that. Okay. And, uh, he, we just started working together. And then as we got bigger, we started, you know, six years ago, probably seven years ago with his YouTube to start this content forward strategy. And he decided to start doing YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, so you, you, you decided as a company to, to have like a face on the internet, on YouTube. So that was the, that was the word. Let's build content. People looking for content. Okay. And we were really just trying stuff. It was a big, it was a grand experiment. So we just tried that. And then we listened to animal spirits. That's what kind of got us doing the podcast, but there was no deliberate strategy. It was just okay. put it out there, put out the content to the world and see what happens. And then he was doing his videos and he got better and better and better. And it's that commitment to that continual practice and improvement and open to experimentation. And there's no master plan. And, and if I was the leader, I, I, I realize I was, I'm not trying to be smart about this, but it's like, try it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to be like. It could fail. So what? Mm -hmm. We've been doing all kinds of things for years that failed. I, we've done radio advertising. We've done call-in shows. We've done magazine ads. We've done lots of different things that Did you never work. know what's going to work yeah. in marketing. You have no idea. So it, the, 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 the success of your podcast and Ben's channel, like, contributed a lot to the growth of the company it contributed to the growth it is one of our top generators of meeting new people to this day but the real benefit is all the unintended consequences that came sure, from it sure and that that's what's really incredible that we never ever imagined that would happen number one being meeting great talent hmm. because this happened concurrent to us having really dramatic growth like we grew I don't know, 20 fold over five years. Wow. So we, a, we hired in one year, we hired 25 people in 2021, I think. That's <laughs> a lot of people. The vast majority came through the podcast because people would hear us, they get to know us, right? As you know, as people build uh, some sort of electronic relationship with you, this auditory, like the power of the of the voice is so strong and you either like the voice or you don't like people listening now either like me or they don't and that's 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 how the world works right but they would hear the message they would hear the people week after week and people started following us and reaching out and saying i want to be part of this <laughs> so we end up with this this pool of motivated smart talented driven people on our team so you combine that and young combine that with my lack of any desire to be the smartest in the room Okay, let's just figure this out together. We're smart people. It's fun solving problems. We know Canada, you talk about Italy, but we know Canada needs us. Why why don't so you're saying that that things are still not very strategic strategically well defined in the content creation like division of your business. Why don't you I mean, I saw that the compound the the day they are like they have a media business right now. Uh yes. Given the amazing results you, you had so far, why don't you structure it? Oh, it's more well defined now. Like I, I'm like, saying in the beginning. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's much more defined now. We're much more deliberate now on mm -hmm. what we're doing. And then it, that's only going to evolve. We're redoing our, our web presence now. We plan on repackaging much of the content into micro content. Mm, for for different that, different yeah. platforms, we're planning, you know, in, improving our our SEO game dramatically. So, you know, Angelica, our our, yeah. our lead of marketing. So we have we have great aspirations for that. You know, Mark McGrath joined us, a phenomenal advisor who has tremendous presence on Twitter. So we're we're we're, we're quite deliberate about this, and and our business sixty percent of the people we're meeting now are coming from website. Twitter, Ben's YouTube, and the podcast. So those are four channels that are very uncommon in our business. Red Holtz, absolutely. I agree with you. I think they're as much a media company as an investment company. Hmm. 
Hmm. Okay, yeah. Of course, the risk is to tilt too much in that direction, of course. <laughs> there is also the Rational Reminder community, which I totally oh. recommend. And it, I think it's the, the, the main uh, online forum, how, how do we want to call it, uh, for Canadian and not only. There is a lot of like uh, even European yeah. Threads. So, rational reminder community. You Google for it, and then you can join. It's free for now. It's free for now. I don't know. It is free. Yeah, it is free. Uh, yeah. How did how did Ben end up on YouTube? It's like it was like a his decision, or because uh, uh, I think his right channel uh, is is pretty successful, even though he's not like publishing that many videos uh, anymore. But it. It came, Angelica joined mm -hmm. and said, we have to create more content. Ben, you should do videos. <laughs> it, it was not more strategic, <laughs> I don't think, than that. And he got the screen and got the microphone and the camera. We started experimenting with different things. And and then I think, I'm not sure which video really kind of went viral, but I know the... I uh, think the top one is still the 5% uh, rule on uh, renting versus buying. The rent versus buy, I think yeah. that's the one. Yeah, That one has been been very popular and is often mentioned. So... Mm. Okay. I um, I love the, the series on cryptos. I, I must admit, when you decide to spin off a bit and take a a single topic and go deep dive in that topic. Uh, and do you plan to do this for other mini series on some specific topic? Because that was very uh, structured and I, I actually loved it. I loved it how you, you, you brought people which were like totally against, uh, people who were like possibilist uh, and people who were like a very uh, pro. And so you, you let people get a huge spectrum of opinions on the topic it, it was a genuine learning endeavor and i thought that was i said this to ben at the time i said this is gonna you look back and this is one of your i think proudest moments because it's classic <laughs> ben go in completely open-minded right do a deep dive and do your best at explaining it so that's that combination of research open-mindedness and communication that uh that is what made it, and it was deep, as you know. Some, yeah, like some of those episodes very were deep. very deep, and and some were very technical. But it's important to 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 have done that, I would argue. So, will there be other series like that, possibly? But what we're thinking about now is different kind of themes. We might have like rational minder, uh, well being mm. type episodes, mm -hmm. rational minder mm -hmm. deep dives. So it'll still be in that rational minder thread. Mm -hmm. But if if you only want the Ben deep dives, you be able to it'll it'll signify that if you if you're okay with Cameron's different stuff, it, that may be identified as well. So that's what we're kind of kicking around right now. I, had a, I I can recommend you to use like playlists. That might be something that so people want to go on your channel and say, oh, there is a playlist on behavioral finance, a playlist on like the basics, <clears throat> or yeah. That, well, that's that. the other thing we're thinking too. Is is because we got like behavioral finance goes in so many different episodes. Is there a way to? Of course, it's yeah. Uh, like where AI might take this, who knows? Oh, that's an amazing idea for uh, for for a new subtopic. Yeah, can uh, you imagine your own customized playlist based on your preference? Hmm. 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 Well, there is already if you go on YouTube, there is like for you the the the, the section that yeah. you get you gonna channel. But yeah, enough. But I'm saying, can you imagine saying I want all the the clips that are behavioral finance and just assemble them all and have AI pull it from all the different episodes. That would be cool. Okay. I'll tell to my friends uh, at YouTube. <laughs> I used to work for YouTube in Google. So oh, uh, that would be neat. To switch back to, to, to like portfolio management and uh, financial advisory. Uh, to this date, what's your opinion on crypto? This was not planned oh. as a question. So. It just comes from the audience. What's my opinion on crypto? The takeaway I took away from all the deep dive that Ben did, first of all, I'm not an expert on crypto. This is just an opinion. It might be worth about a nickel, so take it for what it's worth. <laughs> but the, the essence of crypto, as I understand it, is about shifting of trust. And where should trust go? 
right? And I, and I don't know that crypto represents the right answer for a currency. My gut is no, that is not a comment on performance. That's not a comment at all. I realize what's happening with the spot. Bitcoin ETFs has been, in hindsight, should not have surprised any of us because for sure there's going to be retail demand for this. Yeah. W without a doubt. So a lot of this is, I believe, demand-driven speculation, which is often tilted towards younger males as a research. And we've talked about that a lot in the podcast. Um, I'm just not a fan of, of monetary policy shifting mm -hmm. money to a platform like this. Like, who are you going to call when you lose your password or your like it's just it's just there's so many impracticalities about it um i realize that's not a great answer but that's the best i got for you okay uh we, we'll we'll make it uh surface <laughs> um i gotta take another like another audience question somebody actually offered us two dollars two euros thank you damiano cameron your view on quant hedge fund if you, so you're if talking you... about like um the Renaissance Technologies kind of quant or AQR quant? I, I think it's quantitative, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a fan of, of quantitative, which is rules, my interpretation, rules-based investing. So we've spent considerable time studying factors over the years. I'm a believer in factors. I don't believe that all securities should have the same expected return. I'm not saying... Mm realized return i'm saying expected return so if you believe that there should be different expected returns in securities there must be some characteristic about those subsets of securities that drive why that would have a different expected return so many quant funds go to exploit those differences in expected returns for example if you believe that value should outperform growth you might have a quant hedge fund that goes you know, long value, short growth, for example. So those are kinds of things, for example, that, you know, AQR does in simple terms. So you could do that and install leverage in that to, to magnify those differences. So not a fan of leverage necessarily mm. for the average retail person. I get how mathematically it should have a good outcome. That makes sense. I appreciate that. But when you're talking to normal people with their normal retirement savings, you go and it's hard enough to invest without leverage. And yes, you can run all the models you want. Leverage makes sense until it doesn't. And then what do you do in 2001, right? Um, 2008, you know, 11. How much leverage? But of course, yes. I... Uh, March of 2020, <laughs> right? You wipe out a lot of capital very quickly. Yes, it rebounded, but did you hold through that? Mm -mm. So, so it amplifies the odds that you will not match your investment return because you might uh, behave badly. Yeah. But yeah. if you take Rentech, Renaissance Technologies, they're their main fund. I mean, as we said earlier, phenomenal, brilliant. Mm. Jim Simons and his team, brilliant. We would all invest in that all day long. But if we all could invest in it, it would be way too large. And you've got to believe the returns. I think they said this would mean revert. Like you, It's very hard to optimize. That's why they keep it capped at, I think, $10 billion, right? And they mm -hmm. flush out all the profits every year back to the employees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but rules-based, I love rules-based. It takes it, it eliminates a lot of the behavioral biases. I love, mm -hmm. I love the, the, like we said earlier, the, the, the power of dividends to cause good behavior the power of factors to me around my framework of view in the world. And a lot of this comes from Professor Fama French that I believe in differences and expect to returns. However, once you have that belief, you really have to believe it when you go through periods like we have now where growth stocks outperform value stocks, large outperform mm, small. Mm, mm, this mm, is mm. historically not normal. Th that's why I have problems with factor because I'm also... Uh, uh, my portfolio is factor tilted. Like I'm all, I'm all, almost following some of your model portfolios. Uh, not not exactly your model portfolio, but I'm following the philosophy. Uh, but I've recently read a, a paper by Manuel De Prado, which like it's a meta analysis on how factors are not that scientific so there is not enough data it's more alchemy than uh, than science uh, the methods that they are tested that there's no 
no special attention to causality, but just correlation. And that, that's why everybody's try, trying to find new factors. And there's already like a hundred different factors from different studies. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like, uh, yeah, not sciencey enough. Um, do you? Well, that's, that's the drive for academics to get published, right? Yeah. So that's the, the so-called factor zoo. I think yeah, there's yeah, the over 400 zoo. factors. <laughs> but the simplest factor to me is the value one. Most of it comes down to price. It's some ratio of some fundamental of the company to price, right. be it dividends, profit, whatever. Price is the de determinant. So yeah. the, 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 the price the, to any ratio. What, what, whatever you, it's all ratioed to price in sure. very simple terms. So it, it, again, to make it simple, if the price goes down of a stock, it's going down for some reason. Now, is it behavioral, like Richard Thaler would say? Is it risk, which is what Professor Fahm would argue? There's a story there. No one knows what's true, because don't forget, these are all just models. Models, by definition, are not reality, right? It's just a model. So if a price is lower, and if you believe that not all stocks have the same return, well, if all stocks don't have the same return, something that's cheaper relative to a fundamental should have a higher expected return because the people that are trading all day are pushing that price down for some reason. I'm willing to take this stock off your hands, Giorgio, at a certain price because I have a need for a higher expected return. Is it risk or is it behavior? Honestly, I don't care. Mm. I'm more comfortable with the, with the risk story I'm not saying I'm right, but to me, it makes sense. Price goes down, it's riskier. But I don't want to make a bet on just one stock. I want to own all the ones. Sure, sure. That's the whole point of having a factor. So that one makes sense to me. I'm I not mean, about to- It explains to... the extra return of Warren Buffett almost like <laughs> uh, matches exactly. Uh, but it, it's a reality that in the last 15 years is underperforming. So it's also- mm -hmm. But again, be a real believer to to still. But it's no different than the it's no different than the market factor. Who said the market factor has to have a positive return? Hmm. That's a good point. You, you can go fifteen years. In fact, Ben has a paper that shows that's, that's that a good point. The market factor has less reliability than the value factor. So well, really the first go down the episode with Scott Sederberg was about this. Actually, the episode yes. two two four uh, with Scott Sederberg that actually. He loves to destroy common belief. And uh, yes, uh, I think it was uh, episode 224. And and he actually brought on the table the fact that uh, maybe you can have like period of 30 years, like 13% of 30 years period uh, in, real, in, in, in real terms, like stocks underperform, like you lose money. So which yes. means the market factor is also not guaranteed but how can it not be that it's sure. risk sure it's risk right it's loss aversion you are betting that the, the the price is set to the point where people are willing to to accept that risk and look at it now so many so many investors in the market so many people getting exposure to capital markets largely mirrors my career going back to the early 90s that's mm -hmm. when Participate, participation in the markets, I think, really accelerated. Especially, I can speak for North America. The participation rates are much, much higher. So therefore, indices had great returns over that period. A lot of investors have not. A lot have had good returns. But this whole, I deserve to get this return as quasi-guarantee of the markets, like, no one's... No one yeah, should believe it's that. It's all about expected returns. Nothing's guaranteed. Actually, I recently um, watched a TED talk by Professor Robert Gordon, which was probably 2010. And he explained how in his vision, I mean, I, I like to see also like position contrarian to my to my belief, try to challenge my my belief. Uh, and and there is somebody who thinks that um, maybe uh, we are used to 150 years of exponential growth at this rate, but actually we we consumed a lot of potential growth, and that maybe the future is not like the past. Because uh, we all we all invest in the belief that the market will go up uh, X percent per year. Uh, 
but do you have any opinion on the on the very long term is the is the infinite growth like exponential growth in your opinion continuing forever increasing decreasing that, that's a very philosophical question of course uh it it is a very philosophical question so over long periods of time markets have had returns and their real returns in the five percent range mm. is that a reasonable expectation for taking on that amount of risk seems reasonable mm. now a lot of people have much higher expectations but that's the kind of number that gene fama told us mm. about right that's a reasonable return real return i would say but you're gonna have periods where like morningstar had a piece come out today that larry swedro wrote yeah countering scott cedarberg's research mm. but the, the point of, of of cedarberg's research is that you go back in the 1700s to like the, the mid <laughs> 1900s you know stocks and bonds did about the same mm. yes markets are different information is different i get all that and then from the 40s to the 80s stocks did really well 80s to now Bonds did really well too. There's not a lot of difference because interest rates fell. Bonds did very well. So there's no real guarantee, right? But for people to say, oh, I'm going to get 10, 12, 14% in equities, like, well, everyone clearly mm -hmm. can't mm. make that, I would argue. That seems like a very high cost of capital for companies. Hmm. Hmm. Right? Makes sense. Makes sense. So for that to happen, if we're going to a certain price in the future, that would mean a serious discounting of prices today. Again, that's the value factor, right? Mm, mm, mm. And reversion to the mean. Anyway, uh, sorry, we, we are jumping from a topic to topic, but I, <laughs> th th that's how live, live interviews work. <laughs> uh, coming back to PWL Capital. So you, how does your service work, actually? So you have customers and uh, you... How do you get compensated? What, what's your uh, business model? So our business model is uh, assets under management percentage based. Mm -hmm. And it's scaled. So it starts at a higher number. It goes down to a smaller number. Can, on can the you, next are, are those so numbers uh, public? Or, uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, okay. we're, 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 okay. we're quite... I, I think I didn't find on your website, but uh, we're transparent. Well, it's huh? on the new our website's being rebuilt. So okay, but it's it starts at one and a quarter percent. Okay, for what and that's what we get paid. We don't get paid by any product provider, and then it starts decreasing once you get over half a million. So it starts going down. Then once you get over a million, it starts going down quite quickly. Okay, okay. So, so for that, that's very wealthy people. Uh, it, What's the asymptotic value? Our, the... our our average our average fee is in the 0. 0.8, 0. 0.75 percent okay. range, okay. which in our industry for full service, because we we of course benchmark, we're aware of what the market's at. That's normal, maybe a pinch below. And that's because mm. I think compared to the average firm, we have more larger clients. That may or may not be true, but that's my my belief. So we're we're in the very fair fee. And what's happening, a trend in the industry is the industry's been adept at keeping the same fee, but adding more and more services and more and more mm. caliber mm. quality people. Mm. Mm. So that, that's the dynamic that's been happening for many firms in our space. We don't do any product manufacturing, so there's no extra uh, revenue captured by product. So okay. we, we mainly invest with a company called Dimensional Fund Advisors. Yeah, I saw all your model portfolios are, are, are like contains products from this company. So there is no conflict of interest. You don't get paid by dimensional. No, no, okay. we can't do that. Okay. No, I mean, we get, I, ha I have this Tumblr. <laughs> okay. So they, they gave me that. They count as a, <laughs> as a, as a bribery. They, they gave us, they gave us that <laughs> as a, at a conference, but we pay to go to the conference. We pay for the hotels. I think they, they can buy us lunch. Okay. There's no, there's no soft dollars. So there whatsoever. is uh, like a very harsh regulation. If if you get like a hotel for free, you might you might be in conflict of interest now. You can't you can't do it. Can't do it at all. So yeah, we've worked with them for 20 years now since they've been in Canada. They're, I would argue, 
a very high quality firm. The founders of Dimensional actually started the first index fund. So their roots are in the index fund world. Okay. However, the, the basic belief is that there's ways to improve upon an index because let's face it, once you understand indexing, they're really not as passive. And passive is such a loaded word that 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 we try to avoid that word. Hmm. Um, Interesting. But it's really improving on indices and understanding the sources of returns. So the portfolios are built around the sources of returns. Average expense ratios in Canada are in the 0. 0.3, 0. 0.35% range. These are for globally diversified, mm. factor tilted portfolios, mm. including mm. small cap factor. So it's, of course, a little bit more expensive for that, but they have like real time rebalancing of factors where if you buy a, a typical small cap index fund, it might only be reconstituted every six, six months, months or every year. Yeah. So you, you have tracking error there compared to the, the, the underlying mm. index, but often the index is not the best representation of the source of that individual source of risk. So that's why D Dimensional doesn't benchmark or doesn't use as a source of building portfolios or traditional benchmarks. Okay, okay. Uh, th 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 that's amazing. I don't, I'm not sure if they're also available. I think I, I saw that on Interactive Brokers I can now, I, I think I can access to those funds, but they are not available to Europeans usually. They are not. You, uh, can, you, you get access to the ETFs because they can't restrict access mm. in Canada and the US. It's restricted access to the mutual mm. funds. But in the U.S., well, more and more mutual Europe, funds. Are... Uh, well, Switzerland is, is different, but the rest of Europe, uh, you cannot access to ETF, which are not uh, harmonized by the okay. like, European directive. So I don't think there are the European dimension of European approved dimension. I can, I can invest in uh, U.S. assets, I think even in Canada assets, but uh, directly because I'm in Switzerland. Uh, but for Italians, for example, they, they are not accessible. So... Again, I know Dimensional not... has Dimensional has presence in the UK and mm. Ireland and Germany. Okay, so maybe, maybe. Okay. Oh, there is also Avantis. Avantis. Yes. Uh, uh, there's another. Yeah. Yes. Avantis, <laughs> and we know Eduardo very well. We know they just broke through forty billion dollars. They're, they're arguably a copy of Dimensional. <laughs> Cameron, can you convince George to drop two lightly tilted Vanguard funds in favor of anti ETF? I'm considering that. I'm considering AV DVD. I'm considering that because I, yeah, I'm, I'm not. That's an easy one. That's a layup, <laughs> Giorgio. <laughs> I will do. I will do. Will do. Um, I, I want to to move into the the more. Uh, how can I say? Um, what do you think? What do you think financial advisors are very good at and cannot be cannot be killed by robot advisors or do it yourself? Right. Right? Because people are, are saying to me, sometimes I, I, I mean, just to give more context to this question, uh, I, as I said, I'm in a kind of personal battle, personal fight against like a Italian financial advisor industry because like active fund manager and bank uh, uh, fund sellers, uh, they, they try to, to, to fill your portfolio with crappy products. But there is also like the independent advisor, but there is also like the robot advisor or people say, oh, well, if I, if I have enough skills to understand that my bank, bank advisor is proposing me crappy funds, I, I already have the skills to do it on my own. So just open a brokerage account and invest in diversified low cost index fund. So do you, do you think you are in competition with robot advisors and uh, people who are too much educated and go on your own or put in another way? If you keep educating people, don't you think you're going to lose your job? That's a great <laughs> question. <laughs> Let's, let's chip away at that. First of all, I'm a huge fan for the right people for do-it-yourself. Good. If you can do it yourself, you do not need me. By definition, if you, you can do it yourself, I can't add you value. I can't add value to your life, right? I don't want to try to add value or convince someone to pay me 
if we're not having meaningful impact. That doesn't make any sense, right? Now, I would argue not a lot of people can do it themselves, right? For sure, all the ingredients are out there. You could listen to <laughs> many different podcasts and get access to beautiful portfolios. In Canada, for example, Vanguard and BlackRock both have very good, very low cost, pre-built, globally diversified portfolios with yeah, all like kinds the, of different assets. Like, they're beautiful. Life strategy or target date funds, yeah. Beautiful for 20 basis points. If you can do it on your own, I love it all day long. I don't understand where robo-advisors compete mm. with that. That to me is a harder value prop. And in Canada, you know, our largest, our largest robo-advisor has been getting into things like private equity and mm, crypto okay, and okay. trading and whatnot because they need to create revenue or cross-selling other products, I would think, to justify the massive investment. I think that's a tough game when you're competing against Vanguard for 20 mm. basis points. But I leave it to them to make their value proposition. But the reality is there's a ton of people out there in our world, doctors and dentists are a perfect example where their their structure is complicated. You have corporations, family yeah. trusts, yeah. income splitting with families. We do a lot of work. Like I, I have a team of like on, on our, the advice side of our business, not the operations side, but the advice side. We have a team of twenty five people that work every day, all day, answering all kinds of questions, dealing with all kinds of people, like accountants and lawyers and insurance mm -hmm. people to pull this stuff together, which is really what wealth management is, pulling all these pieces together in a way that helps improve our clients' lives. It's as simple as that, but there's a ton of work, let alone the implementation of the portfolio, tax reporting, tax planning, crystallization of gains for income splitting with family members, mm. setting up spousal loans, that like goes on and on and on. <laughs> Estate and a lot of planning people like, or <laughs> wealth A lot transfer. of people are like, I'm out, I don't wanna do it. My time sure. is too valuable. Sure. Or I can't do it. Like to assume that people can do it, the evidence shows they can't. And and when you look at that get that behavior gap we talked about, if we can help them avoid that behavior gap, our our fee is a fraction of the behavior gap, mm -hmm. let alone all the other services. Mm -hmm. The problem becomes if you start paying in Canada, the average expense ratio in our world is well above two percent. For actively managed the uh whatever and for get this mutual funds in canada are subject to uh what we call a harmonized sales tax you mean it means probably like, at the end of every year you pay capital gain or what no no mean? you pay the province a percentage of the management fee in sales tax in many cases people ah, are paying okay. more to the province of ontario than what you could have bought that vanguard fund for Okay. It's no fault of the province. That's just the tax regime we okay. live in. Okay. Okay. But these numbers get big. You start paying thirteen percent on two percent, like. Okay, so you pay extra this... taxes because you are getting a service from Ontario instead of like Vanguard. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's also tax okay. inefficient. Yeah. Tax inefficient. So I, th I think there's a uh, an amazing opportunity in this world to deliver great advice with these beautiful low fee products given the science that we're all learning about and becoming aware of in today's world just finding that right advisor that shares this philosophy has real discipline doesn't get caught in the creative margin by having in-house product or hmm. you know selling private equity or some other and I, i'm not necessarily opposed to private equity but in many cases it's very hard to justify the fee right Hmm. All about the fee capture. So hmm. that to me is a, a pretty solid value proposition for the right person. If that's not for you, don't pay. Like if that, I don't want water, we, we used to have an amazing. ad in Canada. If I wanted water, I would have asked for water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this comment uh, summarizes it very well. There, uh, uh, this is right. This right here is what is currently missing Spot in the landscape. Uh, the most Spot financial on. advisors are not intellectually honest. They don't care about adding value. So that 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 most, that's that's most amazing. people. What when I say that markets work, you know what I mean. I think our listeners know what I mean. That just believes in the power of the markets, the power of the collective thinking. That statement alone will make most advisors' heads pop off in Canada. Hmm. My job's to beat the market, Giorgio. I can hmm. pick the stocks. <laughs> I can pick the. The fund, the alternative asset class, I can pick, 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 right? 
but it's a it's a full time job with no guarantee of success. Actually, you you're most guaranteed to have expected that it got negative because you pay more fees. Do you does your firm or actually you do with your online mission of like the podcast and the the channel? Do you try to educate your customers? Do you do you are you in the field of like financial education somehow? Absolutely. Absolutely. Financial literacy globally is abysmal at best. You, you've seen Professor Lusardi's work on this. Mm -hmm. Five questions, which you and I would say are pretty simple. Very I've, few people get I've all five seen right. very, a lot of variations. There are many studies on financial literacy, which are a bit more in depth than those five questions. And, and yep. uh, there is also like amazing results. The OECD countries, there is like the OECD ENFE, uh, which is like a subdivision of the OECD. Which that conducts like yearly studies on financial literacy, and I, I'm actually like devouring them because I I want to I don't know I I think part of my mission is like to bring awareness and uh, and help uh, getting rid of financial literacy, but uh, the problem I find is is that people don't those who need to be literate they are not looking for ways to get more literacy. How do you reach the men on the street uh, how do you reach the 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 because those who who listen to the rationally minded podcast probably don't, don't need a lesson on financial literacy how can we reach more people this is the question that ben angelica and myself spend more time on than any other how do you reach the average person because you are right our podcast is way too nerdy for the average person the average person would never listen to it hmm. but what we've learned is many people who have influence in others' lives listen. We get a lot of people reaching out to us that say something like, my son-in-law listened to your podcast. I just sold my pig farm. I need to talk to you. That happens fairly <laughs> often. So that's one way of doing it. The other thing that we're, we're working hard on is, if you heard our interview with, with uh, Dr. Preet Banerjee, he talked about the painkiller strategy. Hmm. So if, if, you, if you wake up tonight, you are unlikely to wake up tonight and say, oh, I need to start taking vitamins and to rush out to the pharmacy tonight to get a vitamin. This can wait. If you wake up, if you wake up tonight with some massive headache or massive toothache that you can't sleep, you will likely go to a 24 hour pharmacy and take mm. something for that. So we're, we're doing this. We're following what Preet suggested, which is a, a call it a painkiller strategy because so many people now, my father just died. I inherited a million dollars. Who do I see? So they inherit That's his the advisor near me or, I'm getting divorced. What do I do? So they're looking out and they're going to Reddit. They're going to Google. They're going to wherever mm. to find out, you know, in this area of auto that I live in, who can help me with my whatever, my divorce settlement. That is proving to be very good because there's a lot of people who listen, who talk in Reddit. And now from a strategic standpoint, we plan on uh, spending more time cultivating those common questions put into our content to feed back into helping mm. you get the right information to the right people because someone might be getting divorced here two blocks from my office that may not be terribly literate but they need legitimate help where do they turn hmm. they're likely going to turn to the internet probably not their friends unless they have someone they really trust that's very different than 30 years ago 30 years ago you would go most to family to their member friend. or the bank teller <laughs> or the bank. I mean, Canada, as you may know, they they love. We love our banks. We have, you know, really? six big banks in Canada. Mm -hmm. Very different than say the United States, which has thousands of banks. So it's a very very different. In Canada, we have a a particular affinity for our banks. And the banks, I believe, the banks oversee in one of their channels well over eighty percent of all long term retirement assets in Canada. We are a bank dominated industry. Okay. Okay. Do you think it's a good setting or uh, something? It's a great setting for stability. It's a great setting for confidence. Like we don't worry about the safety of our banks. Even mm. going through 2008 was never... Uh, I, I, I think we all get great service from our banks. We have incredible... I believe, even though we don't have open banking, I think we have great technology platforms. And you just feel safe. Mm. What you Efficiency-wise... 
like efficiency wise and and i'm always amazed that i mean the polite way of saying it is i'm amazed at the bank's ability to extract such high expense ratios from customers the trust in banks mm. and all you have to say to someone who's considering us versus royal bank yeah but what if it goes wrong you you always know you can sue the royal bank like it's the royal bank mm-hmm. it's the royal bank so i i, I get that mm. i understand mm. the confidence in that mm. Mm. okay it looks similar to italian to, to, to the, it, like, like also in Italy, people go to bank for this, but uh, the, it has a different, I don't know. Do you have an independent advisory culture in Italy? Not much, not much. The, there really? is a, there are people who, there is actually a, like a, a legal treatment. So you, you can get recognized, you can get like a certificate, you can start the profession of uh, independent financial advisor. But I think, uh, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, so I, I, I might be mistaken with the number, but I think like uh, out of, I don't know, 20,000 official advisor, only 500 are, are like uh, independent. The other 19,500 are like not independent. So it's like the, the vast majority of financial advisors are not independent. And, and if you are an independent advisor, you need to face a lot of bureaucracy, which part mm. of it is justified, of course, uh, but there is a lot more. And so you need to reach like a, a there, there is a critical mass if you don't, if you don't manage, I don't know, at least like 20 million. So asset under manager, 10 million, I don't know. There's a minimal amount that it, it doesn't make it worth unless you ask right. that 3%, which doesn't make sense. So, and it's also hard to get like advertisement. I think they cannot even advertise much. There is also some Mm -hmm. rules you cannot do like, of course, uh, confront, like you cannot do comparative. You cannot, there's like, um, same here. uh, How how is it called in English where you cannot do advertisement, like bad advertisement and unfair uh, advertisement. So there are not many. They usually the group in in consulting uh, in like uh, it's called uh, SCF Society of like consulting, uh, but we have uh, Italian postal system. <laughs> okay, that's a meme. Uh, so there's not many. There are few of them, and I don't know the 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 status like the how healthy is the independent advisory industry. So. Do you have a large a pension? Do you have a large pension safety net that might render it unnecessary? Oh, uh, yeah, there is a state pension, but the if you if you look at the uh, the uh, it's it's unsustainable. So every year they are pushing like retirement age further and reducing the conversion rate. So people like if you are below forty in Italy right now, you you know that you won't get much. You you, you will get hmm. something which is probably you know, 40% of your last salary uh, at age 70, which, which means you need to also care for your own pension. And there's something that that's been degrading since 20 years. Like my father like, is now retired since I don't know, almost 15 years and he still got like full package. You go, you, you retire at age 60 yep. and you get like 80% of your last salary forever. It's an annuity perpetuated in eternity. Uh, but now things are changing. So people need to take care of their own. That's why so, a lot of people also like young people start planning to invest for the next 40, 50 years and grow a nest egg. Yeah. So you, you face a similar challenge that we do, which is getting people to realize what lifestyle makes them happy today, understand what that lifestyle costs and watch that lifestyle creep. And if you can find out that lifestyle <laughs> and as your salary increases, you save more as you get older, yes. which is a very tough sell for many people. How I think Ben said it several times that probably is sharp that mentioned that, that the retirement spending is the nastiest problem of all time. And how do you actually uh, help people in retirement planning? You try to you try to go with a constant dollar spending, like adjusted for inflation, or you model as a curve that goes up and down based on that. that that's I mean, a very 
interesting topic to me. It's so fascinating because it gets to what really does get to the root of what makes you happy. So we spend a lot of time when people are approaching retirement thinking about what is your baseline need and what is your wants and how flexible are you on that wanting part? Mm. Because we all know if you can vary your spending in retirement over your retirement, you will be able to spend more. It just means it's going to be wavy. Mm. So we spent considerable energy and time in building a tool that actually mm. allows you to model variation of spending. So you put in that fixed amount, right? But again, you need to understand what makes you happy. Like how big a house do you want? How many cars do you want? Like, and all this goes into that, right? So, but but it's, it's about thinking about that deliberately, not just hopping on the hedonic treadmill and increasing your lifestyle because we're bombarded mm. with these teasing ads all the time to, to accumulate stuff. Right. So we spend a lot of time helping people think about that. Then once you start modeling it, and the software we've built is super cool on this that, that our, mm. our, our dear colleague Braden built, someone who we met through the podcast. Hmm. He built this tool so we can actually model this out and and it does real time Monte Carlo on it, which is very, very cool. And you can taper your income over time. So you want a certain mm. amount up to a certain mm. age. Oh wow. Okay. It's there is there is a, a, a an online tool which is probably like like a, a fraction of what your tool is doing. It's called C Fire Sim, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. It's a, it comes from the Fire community. It's like C Fire Sim, and and you can you can model. Uh, okay, I'm gonna need uh, like a constant amount for this age. Yep. Then I want to buy a house by that that time, or I want to have a fixed spending because I don't know my daughter will be 18 i want to give her fifty thousand. so you can put things and yep. then it does a monte carlo simulation but probably just using historical data it's not actually a monte carlo simulation just like trying to replay your plan from 1920 to to today oh, uh, taking all like uh, uh month by month you have like a sliding window so it's not actually monte carlo it's just um Historical data. The main thing is to to install uncertainty into it. So yeah. You start thinking about because this world uh, is not certain. Exactly. How do you model all the uncertainty? Because uh, you can ask people that they, maybe they are forty today. How do you plan your retirement? But then life happens, so there's a lot of variables. In the end, it's always a mess. It's always a mess, and it's never going to be what you planned on. Yeah, never. And that's <laughs> why it's good to have a buffer in yeah. there, and to be to I would argue to be conservative. Yeah, and the famous so-called 4% rule. Yeah. And I, and I know it's been widely attacked and criticized, but there's still utility in that because a lot of people don't even think about their money in that way. They think about, well, if I can get 5% of my money, I have a million dollars, I can spend 50,000 a year. Yeah, but what about that pesky thing called inflation? Mm-hmm. Well, the 4% rule actually says that you should like adjust your initial withdrawal by inflation, but uh, correct. The the problem is the dollar cost spending method. So, like you, 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 nobody spends the same amount every year. No, but so many people in retirement don't even isolate what they absolutely need. So yeah. What are your housing costs? What's your vehicle cost? Your cell phone? Your insurance? What is that number? And let's isolate that to make sure that is covered. And to think about if that's what you need, but this is what you want, that has a huge impact. Sure, let's sure. face it, in a bad year in the portfolio, you're not likely going to do your round-the-world cruise. You'll put sure. it off a bit. Sure, sure, sure. So flexibility and having like a needs versus want. Do you... Okay, this is a question that that, that comes out frequently in, in, uh, in my recent live streams. Uh, after after a Scott Sederberg uh, episode 284, <laughs> uh, yeah. do you think, well, what's your take on uh, 100% stocks? And uh, do, do, do you think retirees should have like a different portfolio compared to people who are still in accumulation phase? So I agree with what Scott emphatically said, which is you have to be able to live with your portfolio. He doesn't think 100% equities mm. is pragmatically realistic for most people. Behaviorally, and I've lived through it, 
you got 100% equity and you retired and you come into March 2020 and your portfolio is down 30% in three weeks. What are you going to do? Going back to work? Really? Well, if it's in three weeks, you can still can go back to work probably. If it happens but, after two years, it's even worse. Yeah, but if you're $2 million, it's not worth a million four. Yeah. I know it's on paper and I know most of it came back by whatever, <laughs> not, not that long after. I get it. But at that time, we were staring down the pandemic, right? The, there the, were the, 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 corpses, uh, like that famous picture in Bergamo in Italy, like with, with, with tanks bringing corpses, something that never happened before. So you say, okay, the market lost 35% in five weeks. Uh, is it going to mean revert? <laughs> or this is like the zombie apocalypse? Uh, and this is the problem, is that yeah. you could say, oh, I could handle 30% downturn, no problem. Because I see someone's in the asking past. about <laughs> Ask like oh, I could do that. Sure, you could do that when you're sitting in my office, having a nice cup of coffee, or having a pleasant chat in the world. It's a beautiful day outside. But <laughs> I can tell you right now, in September of 2008 or October 2008, very different. You're staring down the survival of the monetary system. Yeah, I was there. I lived it. I wasn't I tell, there. I I can tell you. You can tell me in a nice sunny day in Ottawa that you're going to stick to your portfolio when you're staring down, is capitalism, is monetary policy going to survive? Lehman Brothers just failed. You're the going to news. be fine. <laughs> like, risk is very different when you're in a nice office having a pleasant cup of coffee mm. on a nice day than when the world is doing what it was doing. 9-11, <laughs> right? Uh, March, of, March of 2000. Yeah. Stuff like this happens. So, and Scott talked about that. I mean, Scott's findings were 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 important and very but theoretical and he said that. He said that, absolutely said that. And the question I always ask is like that's looking back, which is great, but what if that's wrong going forward? And and what's your affordability to be wrong? Hmm. What if you're wrong? Nice. What if we what if we go through a 20-year period where you look back and say Gosh, never thought that would happen. Yeah. Stuff happens and you got to be resilient. You have to be resilient not only with what you have and how you manage it, but how you think about it. Like, and this is something that was so fascinating that Dan Harris talked about on our pod last week. We all think that we've got our own, because we, we, we live our lives through our own, our own um, frame of reference. And we think it's, things are pretty constant. You go home after work, you have dinner, you see your kids, you do it again tomorrow. So, it's, But the reality is that we're changing. or The way we think is changing. Our spouse is changing. The world is changing. The markets are changing. Companies are changing. Products are changing. This world is ever evolving, right? So you have to be really resilient in that world. And an interesting uh, um, um, piece to attach to that is like Morgan Housel's book, Same as Ever. So even though things change, how things do change the fact that things do change is always the same hmm. there's always something new and big some big news story something that's happening in this crazy world that you didn't think of look at what's happened the past six months we didn't think of and i don't want to get into the details but stuff is always happening yeah like you you live in the world of technology look at this world of technology what is ai going to do like yeah you'd hear some chatter about ai but it it blew wide open 14 months ago at chat GPT. Hmm. I never yeah, imagined sure. that I wouldn't have Google as my default browser on my web, but we're a Microsoft office. Uh -huh. Now I use Bing. I never would have thought that would ever be possible. Okay. I'm not there yet. So, but, but I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the point is the more things change, the sure, more they stay sure. the same, but there's always something new, but how you will react with your portfolio when you're relying on your portfolio for your retirement income, to answer the question, what asset allocation would I recommend? Well, let's go back to the plan. What does the plan say you need? Are you more like Jerry Seinfeld where you want to do the work and let your portfolio rest? Or do you really need the extra returns from your portfolio? Mm. And do you have the ability, willingness, and need to take on that level of risk? Mm. Everyone's different. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. So it's very customized. People here want to to force you to say something like, hey, so under then 60, 40, I think it's really uh, what I'm learning right now, like I'm talking with people and, and it's really, it's really personal. I mean, assume you have 
a hundred times your yearly spending. Maybe it's even wise to put money under the mattress. Assuming you are retiring with 10 times your yearly spending, you need to face some risk or else you will run out of money. So it's really personal. There's no, there's not a single portfolio. Every People get so hung up, hung up on optimizing portfolios, but how about you optimize your behavior? How about you optimize your spending? How about you optimize your savings? Once you've optimized all these other things, let's talk about the portfolio. But too many mm. people say, oh, it's a portfolio. You've got to optimize the portfolio. Well, if you're young and you don't have a lot, and this is something Nick Majuli talks about, you know, from Red Holtz. Yeah. He yeah. wrote the book, Just Keep Buying. Phenomenal book. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really matter what you earn. It's what you save. How much mm. you save is what really matters. Mm -hmm. Right? But the assumption that it's all in the portfolio, that you've got everything else figured out, not many people I've met have got it all figured out by the time it comes to the portfolio. <laughs> Very good point. But the problem is that the portfolio is more uh, objective. So people try to yeah, optimize it because true. it's more objective, while the, the, the rest is very subjective. So it's like every people is different. Uh, and I like, I probably heard this, I don't remember if it was in the Rational Reminder or, or in a Ben's video, uh, who, the sentence that um, the 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 way you measure risk now uh, is not volatility, but the ability of a specific plan to meet your future needs. So, so that's Ken why French. yeah, it's <clears throat> in French. Okay, it's not Ben, <laughs> uh, and I, I loved it. So it it really. You, you don't need to be exposed to certain type of risk if you if your portfolio is like already there. Uh, that's an amazing sentence. I didn't know it was from Ken French. Okay, I don't know if he's the originator of it, but he did say okay. that on our port, on our podcast. The risk of not risk is uh, not achieving your financial objectives. <laughs> so how do you? Uh, this is a question from one of my readers, an off offline question. I. I if you still have time, like 15 minutes, and then we're done, <clears throat> Cameron. Uh, you know, I'm, I, will... I got lots of time. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to grab some questions that from our Reddit users posted on. Uh, we, we posted like, uh, hey, I have been Cameron Passmore. Can you, do you have any questions? So the user Fuoco Negli Occhi asked, how do you handle extreme or unexpected market events? By you, oh, I don't know if he meant uh, you as a Cameron Passmore or you for your customers. Like, feel free to explore the question uh i have great belief in humanity and our ability to continue to create over a long period of time a better world practically speaking when these events have happened and i can speak specifically to the most recent one which was march of 2020 we use automatic rebalancing portfolios mm -hmm. with 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 our, our our good friends at dimensional fund advisors so every day, and there was days in there where the market moved 10%. Well, if you have a 10% market move and Good you're 50-50, all of a sudden you're 55, 45. Well, it's automatically rebalanced. It's an automatic. Daily or it's like a rule base. Like if it goes above it's, like 2%, you're balanced. No, it's, like it's, it's, it's always real time because they're, they're trading all the time, right? Okay. So it's not, and it's not only between the big asset class, the stock and bond, but it's intra-asset class. So sure. You have times where value does very well. So it's always rebalancing between value and small and around the world. And this is mm. happening all, all the time inside portfolios. That gives me great confidence. Um, the, the risk we run is that we can look like cheerleaders, which to a certain extent, we have to instill confidence. But but there's a fine line be, between just blindly believing everything's going to be okay. But if you don't do that and say, oh, this time is different, Hmm. Like, which is so easy to say, right? You could go to clients and say, you know what? I think it is different. Let's just go sit on the sidelines. Well, if you sat on the sidelines from March through to June. It's always on retrospective. We are like uh, probably falling in the same, the same fallacy that we, are, we were complaining before. Sometimes it will happen that this time is not different. How do you do? Like, uh, <laughs> and that's why it's, it's uh at one time easy, you need to say simple. oh shit maybe 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 this time maybe sh this time i should do something different <laughs> those yeah. are very expensive words because don't yeah. forget if you believe markets are working markets should have priced in all known information uh, of course I, I i'm not talking about that i'm talking about hey maybe this time 
th th that's a meteorite which is going to wipe out the earth. So maybe I better off get the money out and buy uh, uh, weapons and canned food and, and build a bunker or something like this. Look, think about the meteorites you and I have seen in our careers. Not zero, of course. No, no. I'm, oh, you mean, meteor are you kidding okay, me? COVID? Okay, okay said sure, Donald sure. Trump was, Donald Trump is a meteorite. <laughs> I'm not making any political comment. I'm just sure, saying some sure. people said that. Right? You go back through time, different wars that have happened, all these things that have happened. The the the, the Greece we debt survived. crisis. Yeah. Like you, uh, the the SNL loans in the US, you've got 9/11, it goes on and on and on. There's the world is full of stuff like this and it just keeps but on there going. There might be something which is like a slower um yes. I say a slower cycle, like, I don't know, yep. every 200 years, like the Halley yep. Comet or something like, uh, yes, I don't know, US debt. US debt is always growing. If you could look at the past, it's always growing. Maybe one day, boom, will explode or, or this something. This is my point. Or, this is risk. You're not climate guaranteed change. to get that. I mean, You're not guaranteed to get that yeah. risk premium. I agree with you. That is the point. That's where people kind of dump all over 60, 40. Yeah. Well, may not be so bad to have some bonds. <laughs> Makes sense. In in this in this mental space, is it worth or do you um, diversify even outside financial assets or like uh, maybe at one point you should also buy something like more properties or physical gold or something more than just stocks and bond? That may be the case. Okay. Do I now? I mean, I have a property. I've, Lisa and I own our home. Mm -hmm. And I've got investment in this business, which I realize is directly correlated to financial markets. <laughs> A bit, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I there are like many, many amazing questions in the in the audience. Sorry, guys. I, F I really, fire away if you want. I I really would love to 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 get them all, but no, this not this not. Uh, I, I still have a couple of questions. I want to. Uh, I want to ask to you. So sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. The time has flown by. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, what about, I know that you are an avid learner. So you, I, I, I love your presence in the, even though you say, oh, it's mostly Ben, but I, I love your, yeah, like your, 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 your presence in the Rational Reminder podcast. Hey, you, you look to me, the guy who, who, who reads more books than I, than I know about. <laughs> Maybe I have a friend who reads more books than you. Every time you, you happen to have just read another book, uh, what are the books that, that impacted you the most in the last year? Can you mention three, four books? Um, and a meta question, like another question. Um, do you think still reading books is a thing, something people oh. do and should do? Because I myself find that with my attention being fragmented, I, mean, I work online, it's, it's complicated. I'm reading less books. So that's two questions. Like one on the, on the suggestions for more books and uh, if reading books makes still and sense. I, so I had a long discussion with a very good friend of mine about this who used one of the... AI models to give him a book review the way he wanted to understand the book in a format. And it was pretty incredible. Like he, he, he told the style of writing, how he wanted it formatted. And it took a few iterations to get there, but it is a wonderful summary of a book. I love the experience of my Kindle. My Kindle is a great friend of mine. And I, I just, I just, I love highlighting the notes, mm. having it show up in my Evernote, and I clean up my notes, and I try to review them. One of my commitments this year, I'm actually going to read less because I, I kind of felt overwhelmed by this almost waterfall mm. of information. And yeah, I read 61 books last year. So what? 61 last year is more than one per week. How How does I, it? Yeah. I, I read an hour a day plus vacations and flights. I had a lot of flights. So I, I but I, I enjoyed it. But it, it's, it, I, I kind of felt empty because I almost feel I, I deserve too much. The, the content deserves to be absorbed. And you think about it, well, 61 books is a lot, but there's probably 61,000 books published or something. So I'm, I'm still only 
chipping away at a fraction of the universe of books. So like once you realize that, so I've decided I'm only going to read, I'm choosing 24 this year, which is still a lot, but it's only one every two weeks. Old me of six years ago, I, I, I didn't even read three books a year. So, mm-hmm. uh, but to answer your question, ones that I loved lately, one is I read Fortune's Children, the story of the Vanderbilt family. Oh Vanderbilt. my gosh. Okay. A wonderful story, wonderful of how and wild. <laughs> it doesn't go well. <clears throat> so there's one. Uh, a good friend of mine's book, Shane Parrish, wrote the book Clear Thinking, Clear Thinking. which is fantastic. I think it's here. I have it. Yeah. Uh, James Grubman's Strangers in Paradise. Oh, you understand wealth and what wealth does. If you end up having wealth that's different than what your parents had, or or like if you have wealth and you're raising kids, mm, well, mm, you might mm. be framed to raise your kids the way you were raised, which might have been more oh. modest in your means now. So that means you're kind of, a, they use this analogy of being, you think having all this money is paradise, but when you get to paradise, are you going to be like, no, you, didn't, what? you weren't raised with money? Will you be acting like you're wealthy or acting like where you came from and the trade-offs? Oh my God. Interesting. Book. Interesting. I, I, I think I would read this one. Yeah. Oh, there is also Charlie. I. I recently uh, listened to one of like okay with, with Charlie Munger being like dying. I I I re like binge, binge watch some of his like talk, and I think once he was asked something like, um, w- "Don't you are you do you think that you might spoil your?" Your your son your sons your 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 children say of course I would do but if I don't do they will hate me so what the hell should I do something like this so so here's a good uh, he, he, Chris do you know Chris Davis no Chris Davis was on Shane Paris's podcast this week and um, Chris Davis investor in New York City who was on the board of Berkshire and knows Charlie very well and talked about how Charlie said. Money doesn't ruin kids. People ruin kids. Oh. Which I thought was okay, really interesting. Okay. Okay. It's just to link to your point. But that's a very, that's a really interesting interview. Okay. I will. I will. Uh, uh, I, I will listen to it. Yeah. I used to be a member of the, um, of the financial community as well. Yeah. Uh, one one thing about the book, I, I had a mental note I wanted to, to add to the reading conversation. Do you ever reread books? Because mm-hmm. I know there are many like intellectuals who say it's better to reread the same hundred yeah. books several times than. Yes. So I'm starting to build a list of books I want to reread every year. So I just mm. reread 10% Happier in preparation of, of Dan course. Harrison of course. It's a very compelling book on the benefits of meditation. So I am trying to meditate every day mm. another one i've read a couple of times the psychology of money by, mm-hmm. by morgan housel of course it's a great book so those are two that come to mind that are on okay. that that list and do you have any any framework to to better store your knowledge about what you read do you have a, like a personal knowledge uh, management system like a note taking uh, interconnected note taking there was a time yeah. four years ago I, w- I went like deep diving into rome research which is like a uh, note taking oh, yeah. system which is like i don't know if you know about it or other like obsidian or other ways to to have like your own database of book notes or even personal like mm, thinking about something you read so i i use kindle i highlight with my finger notes that goes into readwise readwise which is an app yeah and then it goes from readwise into my evernote so evernote has all my book notes in there i go and clean them up and i regularly review a eh, book or two every week or every couple of weeks okay. just to kind of keep it somewhat fresh but readwise is an app and you can program it for how many past highlights it feeds you per day. So mine feeds me 10 highlights per day. Okay, so it's like a memorize. So essentially it's like space repetition learning. So it pops up uh, something per day randomly. Okay, okay, makes sense. And then it it learns your habits and it'll say, well, here's popular notes that other people have 
in the same theme that you've been reading. So it kind of intersperses ideas from other books. It's very, very well done app, in my opinion. I remember reading, I mean, it's not maybe 10 years ago. I, 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 there's another person I, I would love to invite on my podcast, which is Derek Sievers. I don't know if you know oh, yeah. him. Okay. Yep. I, I think he's like an amazing thinker. And once he wrote a post about the topic list. So he, he reads things and then he summarize things, but not by content, but by topic, you know, so for mm. example, on happiness, on happiness. And then, okay, I, I read on this book, this sentence, or so you, you, you get some vertical on some aspects. So you may say, okay, mm, parenting, and then you get, you get all the notes you extracted from different sources on the same topic. Do you, yeah. do you try to connect things this way or it's too complicated? I'd love to, but yeah. I, I don't. One thing I one one thing I did like after our conversation around designing your life, I printed off my notes and I keep okay. I don't know four or five books notes like this with me all the time. So <laughs> I've, I've read these notes countless times. Like this, all dog-eared and stuff. You can see they're just my notes <laughs> from that book. It had such an impact. I used to do something. See, it's in the other room. I have a lot of printed uh, uh, my own written notes. It's hard to get get on them again because sometimes it's it's not top priority but yeah right. wow cameron uh yeah there are like a lot of topics we didn't touch but i think it's getting a bit too late i will take one question from the audience and um for example last one mm. oh there is this this like on a let's jump on on this last technical question in the italian community like in the italian youtuber personal finance community uh, there is this debate between hey the us is overweighted compared to the rest of the world so i'd rather stick to a more equal weight solution which is never equal weight but try to overcome try to compensate for the dominance of like a few nations. Uh, do you have any thought about this? Do you still think that market cap is the best way to go? Equal weight is basically a value strategy. Hmm. What? Why? Oh, well, because you say, well, it's not guaranteed that countries with lower market cap, they have prices. True, but, but when you're talking about underweight in the US, US's market cap is largely being driven by the high valuations, the growth stocks. Good point. Right? So if you're equal weighting or reducing your weighting there, that's effectively, you got to believe it's going to be more growthy than other countries. Otherwise, other countries would have kept up the same proportion. Hmm. Right? Hmm. So okay. I think it's kind of in, indirectly. It's relatively, okay. You're, you're, you're making a decision based on price, which is a value play. Okay, okay. That, that I never, I, I never thought about this this way. Uh, so don't you, since you are like a quality, like a, a value yeah. lover, don't you use this information or in your planning, or do you? The you may be weight. Yes, or something like uh, maybe let, let, let's underweight the U.S. or other whatever. Or so, so our weighting in our global portfolios is um, one third in Canada, and then the rest. Well, there's of the world a lot of bias. Market. Okay, that's right. Then the rest of the world is is market cap market weighted. Cap. However, it's not. Each country is valued and size, and profitability tilted in of each country. Of course, of course, yes, yes. Okay. Well, Cameron, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, having been here tonight with me. Sorry if it was a bit messy. Also, my English is degrading. I'm not talking oh English gosh. that much in these days. I'm mostly doing things in Italian language. And we didn't cover even 50% of all the questions I wanted to ask. But thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed your, our time together. This was so much fun. And if people want to reach out, I love connecting on LinkedIn. If you have questions, I'm very active and love to hear from people if they do have questions or comments or feedback. And this has been a blast, Giorgio. So much fun. So great to see you. And I'm grateful for the work you're doing together. Like we're we're all in the same community here. 
We're trying yes. to improve people's lives, do good work. You're only on the earth once, right? So we need a purpose. Yes. You know, the famous, yes. the, the Oliver Berkman book, 4,000 Weeks. We'll try to make each week count. <laughs> That's and, another book. Uh, it's in my list. Uh, as I see that too many things to do and too little time. About community, yeah. I recommend my, my audience to join the Rational Reminder community online. It's probably the most informative written, uh, like, like, like text form community in, on the internet right now. Of course, in the video community, the, the top one is still Rational Reminder. And thank you. Thank you again, Cameron. Have a You're nice evening. And when, when PWL in Italy, I think, I think, I, I wish one day, <laughs> not today. It's not in our current business plan. We have enough, uh, enough to do in our country here, but there's good people all around the world. <laughs> and if people reach out, like we know, I, I'm not specifically Italy, but I know a lot of advisors in Europe in general. So maybe some of them do go to Italy. Cool. So happy to connect where possible. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. Great, great to see you. Stay well. Have a nice evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.